on the heels of a lot of interesting information about how we live. And really, in essence, we want to really challenge ourselves this series on what we really do believe about God and how that should affect our lives. And so we're, we're thankful to be able to do this, and uh, we're, it'll be a shared series, and so I, I, I'm not going to do a whole lot of the preaching, so it's going to be uh, fun to watch the other guys wrestle with some of the important characteristics of God alongside of me, and so we're, we're excited about this opportunity. I want to say a special welcome to uh, Noni Smith. I know she's here somewhere back there. Noni Smith, our, our missionary, and we're glad to have her here. Noni had a, just a short little break from uh, the uh, UAE, and so she's just here for this month, and I guess you're going back next week, or this week? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, so if you get a chance afterwards, say hello to her, and then just stay for the Sunday school. I'm excited about that as well. And uh, also wanted to give you just a quick update. Many of you have already asked about Dad, how he's doing. You know that I was away for the last two weeks, and... Uh, Dad's, Dad's doing fine. He he's, continues to become more and more tired, um, weaker and weaker. The medications are keeping him away from pain. Um, the medications are keeping his cancer at bay, but the medications are also deteriorating his health. And so um, we, we, we tried to talk with him about, you know, Dad, if you don't do your exercises, you're going to end up in a, in a wheelchair. And he goes, no, no, no. Um, I'll go to the walker first. And I'm like, no, Dad, you're not understanding what we're trying to say here. You need to do your exercises. He's not, um, but he's ready to be with the Lord, and so we're re ready for him to have that opportunity. And, um, well, I don't know that you ever get ready for that. Um, but nonetheless, as a family, we're prepared for that inevitable uh, situation. Of course, all of us are faced with that, and so um, Dad just has a little bit more urgency to his situation but he's doing well they send their greetings they appreciate so many of you that pray for them and uh, they they, they want to be able to get back up here but uh, it's probably not going to happen and so uh, it it they just want to let you know how much they love and appreciate you and uh, I, I appreciate the fact that I know many of you are are praying uh, for them so it was good to be down there again and um, you know uh, Frank mentioned that, you know, you don't really, do we really know, and you guys all laugh about the, the hugging and, and stuff like that. Well, yeah, that, that happens, and yes, Joan, I did hug my mom for you, and, uh, you know, we did the side hug thing, you know. It's just, and then my brother, who is the exact opposite of me, he's a hugger, and so he just eventually just had to hold me and hug me, and I just get the heebie-jeebies when that happens, but... It was good to be down there and in, uh, in, down south. And you guys, you guys learned, those that are on Facebook, you learned a few things about me, and I learned some things about you. I think it's completely normal to eat squirrel. Yeah, completely normal. But I found many of you thought that that's just weird. Well, let me just tell you, those little haunches, they were really, really good. And especially when you do it Cajun style, you throw it in with a few bunnies, and hey, man, thumper tastes pretty good. So one person commented that you can take the boy out of the South, but you can't take the South out of the boy. Well, that's probably true, because that's just normal. You know, we had a little catfish, and oh, it was just, it was just great. One of the interesting things, though, is that when we went down to Alabama, the next day, my brother and I, we drove straight down to Louisiana, about eight hours to, uh, it, well, you won't know where the place is, but maybe if you know a little bit about Louisiana, you know Lake Charles, which you know, I can see by the stairs, you have no idea. It's in the middle of nowhere, trust me, there are rice farms everywhere. And we went down, and we went down to the farm of a college buddy of ours, my brother's best friend, Bill Miller, and another college friend, Kevin Ritter. So we swapped stories. We talked about the old days. And, and, and it was interesting because Bill Miller was a friend, but Bill Miller was one of those guys that I didn't like. He, he came later in, and he was loud. He was a loud Cajun, uh, you know, and oh, my. He was just over the top. I just never really liked Bill that much. And I couldn't understand why my brother and he became best friends. And they did. 
And, and, and you know, as, as school went on, Bill, you know, he kind of grew on me, but he was one of those guys I didn't like. Um, as a matter of fact, he, he, I don't think he knows it to this day, but I, I, pulled a, I pulled major pranks on him. He had this big old truck, and uh, so I started out by taking the air out of one of his tires so that he would be late for class the next morning. And uh, he, he yelled and screamed about that. I don't know who that is. He was going to stay up all night to catch the guy. Next night, he had two tires flat. And uh, then he just really got upset. And then the next night, there were four tires flat. And it just became fun, and he never did figure it out. I don't think I've had the guts to tell him because he's bigger and badder than I am. So, <laughs> who knows? He might hang me up and skin me like he does all of his meat that he, uh, he catches. But we just had a great time. And it was interesting because this is probably the most extended period of time that I spent with Bill. And what I found out about Bill is he's one of the nicest guys. And my whole attitude changed because, I mean, it's not like I didn't like him, like I didn't like him in college. We became friends of sorts, but I never really spent this much time. We spent a whole week down at his place. And I grew to love Bill Miller because I saw the Bill Miller that my brother knew. Because we lived life together, we experienced things together, and I got to know him. Not the first impression, not the loud, boisterous Cajun LSU fan. No, that's not the guy that I knew. I got to know Bill Miller, and it was a great experience, and we're looking forward to doing it again. And one could argue that one of the greatest responsibilities that man has in this life is to learn to know God. But the questions being asked, I'm sure, in many of our minds, how, do, how does one really do that? How does one learn to know God, especially a God who we can't feel or touch or see? How do we really know Him? And, and, and many have taken up the task of, of trying to accumulate all the information that we, we have. And the nice thing is God has revealed Himself to us through His Word and through our experiences. And He's revealed Himself to us. And, and, many, and many have taken up the task of, of gathering all this detail together and codifying it, putting it into big theological texts. And you could say in that sense that we know God. But really, do we know God because we've got all that information? The answer is no. That would be like me saying, I know Jim Kick. Now, some of you will know who Jim Kick is because he's part of the famous 1972 Dolphins team that was undefeated. He was a running back for the Dolphins. That would be like me saying, I know Jim Kick. Well, I can tell you a lot of stuff about it. He was one of my favorite players. But the closest I ever got to Jim Kick was dating the babysitter of his kids. That's as close as I ever got. I tried to get her to take a jersey and get it for me or something. She wouldn't do it. She didn't want to jeopardize her job. I mean, they paid well. He was making lots of money. So just because I know a lot about Jim, K, I, he doesn't know me. I really don't know him. I know about him. And sometimes that's where we stay as believers. We know a lot about God. We may have the theological understanding of God. We may have the book knowledge. Now, this series, we're going to talk about the theology of God. We want to understand what God has revealed to us about Himself. You can bet we're going to teach the theology of it. But we're not going to stop there. We want, and our desire is, for that knowledge to be translated into a more intimate relationship with God. We want to take what we know and figure out what we know about God and how that affects how I live every day. To know God is important. To know about God is not as important as knowing Him. Really, God is not much interested. This is the point that I want us to get. God is not much, so much interested in us knowing about Him as He is in us knowing Him. And there's a big difference. A huge difference. We're going to be asking that question over and over again. How do we really know God? And I, and I want to suggest to you the biggest obstacle the biggest obstacle that we have to knowing God intimately is us. We're the problem, not God. God's revealed Himself. God desires to be known by us. 
We're the problem. I love what Dr. Larry Crabb says in his book, Finding God. A great book written a long time ago. And I think he hits at the heart of our lack of intimacy with God. Here's what he says. In today's world, we have shifted away from finding God to finding ourselves. You don't have to go very far than the bookstore to find all these self-help books. We're all about finding ourselves, and we've shifted away. Even in the church, we've shifted away about finding out about God to finding, out, finding ourselves. We have become committed to relieving the pain behind our problems rather than using our pain to wrestle more passionately with the character and purpose of God. We see this repeated over and over in Scripture. My brother has written a book. We're studying it in our Sunday school class. Um, called the uh, story of the Old Testament. He makes a similar point when he, he's examining the exodus of God's people from Egypt. And over and over again in the book of Exodus, which we're going to get to in just a moment, over and over again, God states His desire to be known. And it's evident that He places people, His people, in places of difficulty to help them know Him. And we, we don't like that part. We don't like the idea that God places us in difficulty so that we can learn to know Him. But it's said over and over and over and over again in the book of Exodus. They didn't get it. They missed it. And so do we. We miss it. And so I love what my brother says in his book. And, and here's what he says. When relief becomes our highest goal, we miss what God is doing in the bigger picture, and that is why the story of the Old Testament and the story of the Exodus and the story of whatever you want to put in there is important for us to understand. Because it's through those stories that we learn about who God is, what God's doing in the bigger picture, and how God brings His people through difficulty, and in the process they have the opportunity to either know Him better or to live in rebellion towards Him. More times than not, more times than not, they rebelled because they didn't understand the role of difficulty. They didn't understand life. And God wants us to come to the conclusion that we can't make it without Him. We sing about that, we talk about that, but the question is, do we really understand that? We cannot live life apart from Christ. We cannot make life happen without God. And so... We, God wants us to get to that point. And there's no escape. There's no escape from the pain and the problems. So as we turn to Him, we can find hope and joy and peace in the midst of the struggles. That's what the teaching of the Word of God gives us. God does not promise to deliver us from the pain and the struggle. What He promises is to walk with us through it. Because it's the pain and the struggle and, and the good and the bad that God wants to teach us about Him and grow us in, in our intimacy with Him. But when we look at life and we say, if it's not perfect, then somehow God's abandoned me, we miss out on getting to know Him and we miss out on the joy, the peace, and the comfort that God can provide in the midst of it. Because relief ultimately is our highest goal. There is no plan, nor can we be obedient enough to the biblical principles to elim eliminate life's unpredictable struggles that can bring us such pain and fear. The stepping out in faith that Pastor Woogie talked about last week is the first step in a long journey of knowing God. We saw in the life of Peter how Peter doubted and sunk. If we doubt, we're going to sink. But God's calling us on a journey to know Him and that knowing journey is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be trouble-free. As a matter of fact, if there's one thing that the Word of God teaches us and my life experience teaches me, is that if I'm going to seek to know Him, I can expect life struggles. I can expect pain and anguish and difficulty because that's one of the means which God uses to grow me and to mature me in helping me understand. He has revealed Himself to us. The remaining question is, will we apply what we know to life, which in turn will grow our intimacy with God, or will we miss the opportunity because we do not understand what God is doing? So you should have your place in Exodus 34. 
want you to read with me, follow along, as we read verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. This is an encounter that Moses has with God. And God reveals Himself to Moses. And we often get caught up in the story about Moses having to hide in the cleft and all that kind of stuff and worried about because he can't see God face to face. But when God says, I answers to Moses' request, I want to know you, I want you to see what he says. In verse 5, here's what it says, And the Lord descended in a cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed... This is what God says. This is how God revealing Himself to Moses and answering Moses' request. I want to know you. Here's what God says. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, we love this part. But then he goes to the next part. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on their grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And Moses made haste to bow low towards the earth, and he worshiped. Let's pray together. God, we, we come to this passage. This passage is like holy ground. Because in it, you reveal who you are, the totality of who you are. You are a kind and gracious and compassionate God. But you are a holy God who will punish the wicked, who will deal with the guilty, who refuse to turn to you. This is you. We are your people. We long to know you. We long to experience you. We long to worship you. Help us as we study this word together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now my question this morning as we introduce this subject, we're not going to deal with any of the character of God, but we're going to ask this question, who is God? And I think that's where we have to start. Because until we recognize who He is, we're not going to be prepared to learn about Him. And so we have this common dilemma that we're all faced with. Here's how I put it into words. God is immeasurably good, and He can be trusted. We see that over and over and over again in Scripture. We see this in Exodus 34. The, the passage that I just read to you is one of the more quoted passages in various forms of all of what God says. It's an amazing passage. But God is immeasurably good and He can be trusted. But we will never be able to know this until we know Him. If we don't know Him well, we can't understand what He's doing. And when we don't understand what He's doing, we have a tendency to run in rebellion or, or, or to have wrong thoughts about Him. And so we need to understand who God is. And so this passage in Exodus 34, I, I want you to see the historical example that, that it provides for us. And we need to back up in, in this passage because it's, it's, it's in the context that we need to understand. So when you go back into Exodus, all the way to back to chapter 20 is where we'll just, for summary's sake, this morning. In Exodus chapter 20, we have the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments. Moses, as you know, goes up on the mountain and God speaks with him and, and God tells him to take the tablets and to write down the, the law, the Ten Commandments. But also, Moses spends a long time up there, 40 days and 40 nights is what we're told, talking with God. God gave him instructions about all different kinds of things, not just the Ten Commandments. And while Moses was up there, the people were down in the valley waiting for Moses to return. They knew they went up to speak with God. They could hear the thundering. They could see the cloud coming over the mountain, and they knew Moses was up there somewhere. Forty days, forty nights, and they became impatient. And so in their impatience, they turn to Aaron and say, hey, make us a God that we can worship. And so they make this golden calf. And, and God sees what's going on. He tells Moses to go down. Moses intercedes for them because God says this, you're going to go into the land that I promised, but I'm not going with you. And Moses pleads with God, God, you have to go with us. 
I'm not going to do it. Moses pleads. Moses gets down, we're told, and down into the valley. He sees the people, sees the golden calf, and he, in his frustration and his anger, he throws the tablets down. They shatter. God calls Moses back up onto the mountain, and again, Moses writes down the law. Moses intercedes, and God says that I will go with you. Look at Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verse 3. We'll pick it up in verse 1, just to grab the context of this particular verse. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it. And I will send an angel uh, before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite, the Hittite, the Pezzarite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst because you are an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. Well, there's a warm fuzzy for you. <laughs> Here's God saying, you know, go up. I'm going to give everything that I promised, but I'm not going to go with you because I'm, I, I'll, I'll probably destroy you on the way. Well, if, if we remember the story of Israel in its uh, journeys, we realize that, yeah, God's, God's being nice here when he says they're obstinate and rebellious. They deserve to be zapped. But before we become too critical of them, I think we ought to be a little introspective ourselves and realize we're not much different. And so Moses pleads with, with, with God, again, this intercession. And then verse uh, 13, it says this, Now therefore I pray you, if, you have found, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways. He says, let me know your ways that I may know you so that I might find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And then God says this in verse 14. And he said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. There's so much stuff that's here. Moses sensing that God, if you don't go with us, God says, I'm going to give it to you. And Moses says, that's not enough. I want you to go with me. Moses has a sense. His people are struggling. I, I read this passage and I wonder, okay, Moses, where have you been? God's shown you His ways over and over again. How much more do you need? But Moses is just like us. God shows Himself to us and, and we doubt. That's our common dilemma. We, we struggle with the God that we know because we truly don't know Him. And then life struggles. And as soon as the water dries up or as soon as something goes wrong, we're going to be just like the children of Israel. We're going to start grumbling and complaining. I deal with it on a regular basis in my own life and I deal with it on a regular basis in your life. What I hear coming from people, what I feel in my own heart, when life is kicking the slats out of my life, as Dr. Howard Hendricks used to say, when, when, when everything in life seems to be just crumbling around me, we struggle. Where are you, God? The psalmist struggle. God, how long? That's our common dilemma. And it goes back to we don't have a true understanding of who God is and what God's doing. And so Moses is praying, God, I want to know your ways. You need to go with us. And so they do. Notice a couple of other passages of Scripture that uh, help us see God's view of us. Look in Habakkuk. That's not a book that we go to very often, but uh, nonetheless, we're going to go to it this morning. In Habakkuk uh, chapter uh, 2, Habakkuk chapter 2, it's towards the end of your Old Testament, if you're looking for it. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14, hear what God says. Um, we'll pick it up in verse 12. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that the peoples toil for fire, the nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's a moaning over the fact, a groaning over the fact that the earth kind of just continually tries to move on its way, but God says, my glory is going to fill the earth. Jeremiah known as the weeping prophet, and for reason. He, he wept over the, the uh, children of Israel and their rebellion, and, and his job as a prophet was, 
was a horrendous one to take on. But in Jeremiah chapter 2, in verse 5 down through verse 13, listen to the words here. Jeremiah 5, Thus says the Lord, What injustice did did your fathers find in me? This is God speaking to the children of Israel. That they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty. They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the land of the deserts and of the pits, through the land of drought and deep darkness, through the land that no one crossed, and where no man dwelt. I brought you into a fruitful land to eat its fruits and its good things, but you came and defiled filed my land. My inheritance you made an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle law did not know me. And the rulers also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied Baal and walked after these things that did not profit. Therefore, I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your sons, and I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Kittim and see, and send to Kidar and observe closely, and see there has been such a thing as this. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory, their glory being God Himself, for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens! At this, shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew them for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They forsook him. God says, My glory will be known throughout all the earth. But the people who knew him or supposed to know him forsook him. Jeremiah chapter 9. Verse 3, and that's the, this is the last one. We could read many of them in the uh, book of Jeremiah and the rest of the Old Testament, but this is sufficient. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3. Verse 1, we begin, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes fountains of tears, that I might weigh, weep de- day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert wayfarers, lodging places, that I might leave my people and go for them. For all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like the bow lies, and not truth prevail in the land. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me. There's a common theme theme that we see in these passages and other passages. There's a common theme because they did not know God. They failed in the way that they lived for God. That's the common dilemma. And as we bring it to our contemporary situation, there we recognize, if we are honest, there is a knowledge gap. Do we know about Him, but do we really know Him? Do the test of life produce in us independence, where I'm going to do it myself when we're faced with those difficulties of life? I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to make this happen, or do we fall in dependence upon God? Do the situations of life, when they become difficult, make us better, or do they make us bitter? That's the question that's before us. That's the common denominator that we see with all men, mankind. Because all of us are faced with pain and struggle. Some of us face that pain and struggle, and we fall in worship and dependence upon God. We cry out to Him to know Him, or we, we, we grumble to Him, get us out of this. And there's a big difference. And so what we want us to do is we want us to understand who He is so that we will hold on to Him rather than walk away from Him. And the reason why we think this way is because we have some um, defective thinking. But what I want you to understand here this morning, this, I don't want to leave this point before we, we say this. God yearns to be known by us far more than we want to know Him. That's established fact. God wants you to know Him far more than you want to know Him. God yearns for this. And He brings and uses life difficulties to bring us to the brink of a decision. Will I get to know Him better or will I become bitter? Those are the two basic choices. What am I going to do with life? Ultimately, what am I going to do with God in the midst of life? And I know some of you out there facing some very difficult things. 
And I understand the desire for relief. And there's nothing wrong with saying, God, I want relief. But the point of the passage and the point of, of what I want to say to you today is, is that relief is not our highest goal. To know and understand God should be our highest goal. That's what God wants. That's what God's doing. I mean, I've watched my dad go through this process. They, eight years ago, they told him he had six months to live. Eight years ago. And I've watched him go through and deteriorate over and over and over again. But one of the things that I've noticed about my dad is that he has a greater love and appreciation for God than he used to. He's a different man than he was. There are days when I don't know what to do with this guy who cries and wants to hug and... Uh, I don't know what to do with him. He, that, what did you do with my dad? Some alien took over his body. But no, I think really what happened is he's, he's growing in a different way. And he's spending hours in prayer because that's about all he can do. And he cherishes that time. And he's changed. And that's what God yearns for. And sometimes we, we don't get there because we have defective thinking. And so that's what I want to spend just a few minutes talking to you about here this morning, the defective thinking. As we think about God, how do we view Him? Well, one way that we defectively think about God is we think about Him as our grandfather. Now, you know that I've become a grandfather, and I'm enjoying that phase of life. I'm, I'm not in the goo-goo stage that some of you tend to get into or, or whatnot, but I, little Laney has a place in my heart that it's just hard to explain. And those of you who are grandparents, you understand that. There's something really cool about having that kind of child come into your life where you're not responsible to discipline them. And uh, people are, you are not examining how I'm raising Laney because I'm not raising Laney. That's Tim's problem. That's not my problem. When Tim and Tiffany were here, you were watching them and seeing, okay, does John know how to handle his kids? And rightly so. That's what the scripture talks about. A man that's in leadership of the church ought to be able to handle his family. Well, man, when they got out on their own, I went, man, we made it through that one. Woo! And, you know, there's still a little fear that they're going to make some silly decisions and things like that, and that's still a possibility, but it's a joy to watch them walk. But with little Lainey, all I, all I get to do is, is just love on her, you know? And, and that's really cool. That's really fun. She goos and gaws at me and... I think she even likes me. It's kind of cool. She doesn't know all the stuff that you guys know about me. She just, she just thinks I'm kind of a nice guy to hang around with. And, and, and she's allowed to get up close and grab my beard and look at me real close, which I really, none of you can do that. No, 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 no. Don't even try it. <laughs> no, I mean, she's allowed to do that. And, and so... As a grandfather, we kind of get that idea. The grandfather's this warm, fuzzy guy. The beard's getting gray, and, you know, he chuckles, and he laughs, and he plays, and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes that's the way we look at God. He's this warm Santa Claus in heaven or something. He's his grandfather. Now, the point, the reason why this is bad, the theology and bad thinking, is that Focusing on the warmth of God. And we hear a lot about God is love. And that's, that's true. But when we overemphasize that, we get a warped view of who God is. And, and so focusing on the warmth of God may make us feel better, but there's more to God than, than His love. It's interesting when you go to Revelation uh, chapter 5, you're going to see that, that, that God's holiness is what's focused on. It's in other passages, like Isaiah 6, it's His holiness that they cry out about. It's not His love. It's His holiness, because His holiness is the controlling attribute of all of who He is. And so we may focus on the warm and fuzzy, and that's where we get defective thinking. It's not that God isn't loving and isn't that, that at all. But when we say that that's it, that's who He is, we miss out on the totality of who He is. God is not our warm and fuzzy grandfather. He's a holy and righteous God who is to be feared and to adored and loved and worshipped, but he's not our grandfather. So that's one defective thing. Another defective way of, of looking at God is, is he's like our waiter. 
Or some even say he's like, you know, the genie in the bottle. We rub it with our prayers and out pops this genie that says, okay, I'm going to grant you three wishes. God is not our waiter. It's not like we, we, we're going to a restaurant and, and uh, the, the person that comes to wait on us, we expect good service. And if we get good service, we'll give them a, a decent tip. If they give us exceptional service, we may give them a really good tip. If they give us lousy service, we may choose not to give them anything at all. And sometimes that's the way we view God. You know, when God is doing good things for us, we are all about praising His name. But when God is pulling us through difficulty, we're whining and complaining, where are you, God? When are you going to fix this? What's the matter with you? I deserve better than this. Now, we won't necessarily say that out loud in front of people. But if you're honest with yourself, if I'm honest with myself, when life is not going the way that I think it ought to, or when God's not doing how, things how I think He ought to, we become whiny little babies who throw out temper tantrums, and we try to keep it under control, we try to spiritualize it all, but in reality, in our hearts, we're saying, God, you're messing up here, you need to fix this. And God's wanting to say, listen, I'm God, I'm in control, I know what I'm doing. There's a bigger picture here. But when God's doing good things for us, we'll lay down a tip for Him. We'll give Him an extra little praise. If He's really, really good, then we're going to shout it on Facebook or something like that. You know, I mean, it's like, wow, God's awesome. God's awesome whether He's dragging you through difficulty or whether He's blessing you. It, it, that's who He is. He's not our waiter that's there to wait on our, at our beck and call. He's God. Notice Revelation 5. I mentioned it earlier, but turn there with me. Revelation chapter 5, because we, we, we get a picture of who we are that we miss out on sometimes uh, quite readily. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Here's, here's, what it, here's what he says. And they sang a new song. He's talking about they're gathered around the throne. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. Blood of men from every tribe and, and uh, your, your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them, and listen to these words, a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon earth. Don't miss out on this. Here we have this great throne worship and from every tribe and nation, people crying out, worthy is the Lamb. But what they're rejoicing is, is that God, you've made us a kingdom and you've made us priests. We're your servants. And we get it backwards. We look at God like He's some genie in the sky. God, you're there to serve us. When we're in trouble, you get us out of it. When we have needs, you give us. Rather than, God, you're God, and I'm here to serve you. I'm your priest. I'm here to do at your bidding. That's what God calls us to. He's not our waiter. He's our Lord. He's our God. He's sovereignly in control of who we are, where we go, and what we go through. And our worship is not to be based on our circumstances, but based on His character. And that changes the way we look at life. And it changes the way we look at God. Here's the point. God is not worthy of our praise and our honor because He has served us well, but because He is God and wants to be known and can be known. Now there's a third defective way that we look at things or look at God. And sometimes this has become very popular in our culture and in our day that God is some kind of a monster because He doesn't do things the way we think He ought to. Our problem is, is that we tend to elevate man and our view of man, and as a result, the view of God is brought low and we see God as mean and insensitive. When we get to passages in the Old Testament, when God confronts His people, and He said, I told you to destroy them. What, what's those sheep I hear bleeding in the background? We go, ooh, God's mean. Even in the passage that we looked at in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 34, where God says, I am a compassionate God. I'm committed to my people, but I will not let the guilty go unpunished. We go, ooh. We don't understand. God's a holy and just God who extends mercy time and time and time and time again 
But God says, I will not contend with men forever. We like to emphasize one aspect of God. And when we do that, we, we come up with this, God must be a, he's just a meanie up in the sky. He's ready to zap everybody. What's the matter? Where's this God of love? And our culture is troubled by that. And the problem is, is that we tend to elevate the view of man. Man is great. And God is only great when he does great things for man. Man, I've got news for you. Man is not great. We are rebellious. We are sinners. We have fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. It's only by God's grace that any of us are saved. But He's extended that mercy to us. He's great and greatly to be praised. Why? Because in spite of our rebellion, He still came to us. He still sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. Yes, we live in a messed up world. Yes, this place is going crazy. And I don't understand it. But I'll tell you one thing that is evident wherever you look in our world. Our world is killing itself. Why? Because man left to itself will destroy himself. Man is not to be elevated. God is. God is the only solution. And so God needs to be understood not as a monster, but as a savior. A God who's gracious and patient but a God who will not contend forever. So our proper desire in all of this as we move our way through this series together is that God has to become our passion and God needs to be understood as our greatest need. In a book by a friend of ours, uh, the Yeckleys know them, they served in Dominica with us. He wrote a book called God Up Close and Personal. His name is Chris Berner. And in one of his early chapters as he's talking about God up close and personal. Here's what he says. And I think it hits at the heart of what Dr. Crabb, what my brother, what I think God wants us to understand. Here's what it says. The greatest need in life is not to make sense of problems in life and find solutions for them. It is to know God in all his glorious character, to understand how to live life in light of who he is, of who God is. That's our greatest need, is to know God. And when we allow our defective thinking to interfere, we begin to look at God in ways that are inappropriate. But when we allow him to be God, we are beginning that journey, taking that step of faith of learning who he is. Yesterday we had the joy of... of uh, celebrating the union of Mike Olszewski and Shana as one in marriage. And it's, it's, a, it's always a fun thing to watch a young couple step into that. But it's also humorous. They think they know each other. They are totally clueless. Melanie and I will celebrate 32 years of marriage this week. And uh, I can testify to the fact that 32 years ago, I knew I was clueless. I was also scared spitless, as we would say down south. But I thought I knew her. 32 years later, I'm still learning who Melody Tally is. And I know her better now than I did then. And I'm more thankful now than I was then that she chose to walk life with me. Because we've learned to walk together. All of us that have taken that step, we understand that in the beginning, we thought we knew. But as we progress through life, were there ups and there downs? You bet. But the longer we go, the more I know, the more that I trust. I know she's faithful to me. She knows she's faithful. I'm faithful to her. We have a confidence in one another. Because we've walked life together. In these next nine weeks, we're going to look at God a little bit more closely, a little bit more intimately, and we're going to invite you to take a, that journey together and learn to know God. It's not going to be easy. As we've seen, God uses difficulty. Here's the point. God will use that difficulty to bring about intimacy. 
that intimacy will give us greater con confidence that we can be trusted. God is immeasurably good, and he can be trusted, even when life is falling apart. But we'll never get to that point until we know him. And that's why we want to spend some time getting to know God so that we can learn to walk better in his journey of faith. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives and in our church. We recognize that we still have a lot to learn. We have much to gain as far as knowledge. But we know that you are not a God who, who wants to just have us know more about you. You are a God who desires us to know you, to know you intimately, to be able to experience you fully in life's good situations and in life's bad situations. You are a God who deserves our greatest praise, and you are the God who we come to, to worship, to adore, because ultimately, you, God, you are God alone, and we know that. Help us to know it. Even as the man in the gospel said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We stand before you as a people who need you. We want to know you. Help us to know you. We know you, but help our, our lack of knowledge. Guide us in your truth. Help us to learn to love you more deeply as we walk through life together with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we close. You are not a God created by human hands. 